Hi, this is Owen Perkins with Clean Slate Now Action. Um, we're a, uh, a advocacy group that works at the local, state, and federal level. We're based in Colorado, and we focus on getting the corrupting influence of big money out of politics and campaign finance reform. So I'm uh, happy to be able to join you virtually today. I am, um, unfortunately, my day job is I'm a baseball writer uh, and I'm up covering the All-Star game um, as we speak. So uh, rather than compete with 50,000 uh, fanatics to be heard over the Zoom, I'm uh, giving you a pre-recorded presentation. But um, uh, I do have some long roots in Colorado Springs. I was a, I am a graduate of uh, Colorado College. I taught at Fountain Valley School, and um, I was most recently an editor and uh, writer at the Colorado Springs Independent. So um, love the community, uh, love living there, and I'm happy to be with you tonight to talk about campaign finance reform for the city. So uh, let's get right into it. You do see our website there in case you want to um, connect and my phone number and we'll put this up and email, put this up at the, at the end also. But I uh, wanna just get into why campaign finance matters for Colorado Springs. Now there's a real distrust of government going on and a belief that big money is, is breeding corruption in our campaign system and in our elections. Uh, we've got a system slanted toward protecting and often hiding big money and drowning out speech of everyday Colorado Springs voters and residents. Um, this results in a council that hasn't always historically reflected the population. Um, and, it, and it's some disengagement. When you've got that corruption, you get disengagement. We wanna get citizens re-engaged again um, and uh, claiming ownership of their elections again, getting citizens owned elections again. Uh, you know, when they see that corruption and feel like big money is running everything, most of us feel like we can't make a difference. Um, there was a study a few years ago by the George Bush uh, Institute, the University of Pennsylvania Biden Center and Freedom House, which found that eight in 10 Americans are concerned about the condition of democracy in our country. 68% um, believe democracy is getting weaker. And the biggest reason they identify for that is big money in politics. Um, we've gotten to a point where People are questioning, you know, is it really one citizen, one vote, the way this country was founded, or are we evolving into one dollar, one vote? That's not uh, that's not what we've ever been about. But the University of Princeton says, you know, we're not always what we think we are, and they don't. They they did a study to see whether the government is actively, accurately reflecting the the will of the people, and they came up with this chart, which is pretty basic and common sense, and the idea that if 80% of the people you know, or whatever percent of the people believe in a certain idea, it ought to have that correlating uh, percent chance of passing. So 80% of people believe in a policy issue and there's a bill reflecting that, it should have an 80% chance of passing. In fact, what they found out was that every bill in Congress has a 30% chance of passing, regardless of the support. Zero support, 30% support, 60% sure support, 100% support, it's gonna have a 30% chance of passing. The only thing that makes a difference is engaging the wealthiest part of the population, and that includes corporations and special interests. And when they weigh in, start trying to influence, uh, make their voice heard, they, they are heard. Um, you see that yellow area there is what represents the voice of that top 10%. And when they are behind an issue, the chances of it passing doubles to 61% um, on the average. Uh, and that leads um, University of Princeton to believe that you know, money is playing an outsized role in politics. And we actually have a system where corruption is legal in America. Um, it's easy to understand why special interests want to be involved. They get a 22,000% return on investment. When they back something, they get tax breaks, they get exemptions, they get uh, kickbacks, uh, all kinds of perks for being big donors to their elected officials. Um, and what we get as a result is a legislative body that doesn't reflect us, doesn't reflect the, um, the population, the demographics of the population as a, as a whole. We're seeing um, you know, policies reflecting now the views of white, male, and rich, now and probably always have been reflecting that demographic. Donors who give $5,000 or more to campaigns um, 
94% of them are white. Uh, elected officials, 90% are white. This is not a coincidence. Uh, and you can see this in Colorado Springs. Nine out of 10 of your city council members and mayor are white. 10 out of 10 um, are over 58. Eight out of 10 are males. I'm sorry, 58 or over, I think, but uh, not to cut anybody off of the year, but uh, eight of 10 um, are males. So this is playing true very well in Colorado Springs. I never believe these figures, uh, but it, it shows up and it, they don't reflect the population. This is a few years old, these statistics, but um, they also uh, show up with candidates. Not only are we electing candidates who meet a certain uh, demographic, but we're only running candidates who meet a certain demographic. And that's because of the necessity of wealth or access to wealth uh, to enter that realm of politics. Now, you know, if money is speech, as the Supreme Court has declared, how do people of modest means speak in this country? Um, dozens of cities, counties, and states around the country have found an answer and made recent major reforms that are having tremendous success in restoring power to the people and protecting our democracy from becoming an oligarchy. These are you know, dozens of groups that have done it over the last year at every level in the country. Um, we're doing it in Colorado. Four of the biggest cities, four of the five biggest cities in Colorado have uh, passed or are working on reforms um, over the last four years. Started with Denver and the Democracy for the People Initiative, which bans corporations from donating directly to municipal campaigns as they're currently banned at the state and federal level. Um, it lowered campaign contribution limits from a relatively high limit to be on the level of the significantly lower state level campaign. Um, they created, this is the big piece of the pie, a publicly financed campaign system, nine to one match. So your $10 contribution becomes a $100 contribution. Your $50 contribution becomes a $500 contribution. This only applies to contributions of $50 and under, and it's for candidates who opt not to expect, accept special interest money in their campaigns and meet other criteria of qualifying. Um, it also requires the disclosure of dark money, which is huge and you know, gets the spotlight on who is trying to buy these elections. So that's the first. The second, um, well, here they are, a, a, a close look at the effect. Um, this is looking at a, a race before this went into effect, but you can see on that top line, there was a two to one advantage that candidate B held over candidate A just based on the money they raised. When you put in the new limits and take out corporations, it became pretty close to even money on that second line, uh, much closer at any rate and, and really getting to e even money if they all opted in for small dollar um, for the public financing. And when you add in the public financing on the bottom line, um, you end up actually with more money um, and uh, an even, I mean, a, a, an equally um, footed race, you're playing on a level playing field. Uh, so a tremendous difference maker, um, this reform in, in Denver. Lakewood was next in 2019. They lowered their contribution limits significantly, again, to align with the state levels. They banned corporations and labor unions from contributing. When we say corporations, that always includes labor unions, um, anything that's a uh, corporation. They ban anonymous contributions. They require disclaimers uh, to show who's paying for electioneering. I'm just hitting some of the highlights of their comprehensive reforms. And they added fines to double, up to double the amount contributed. So it used to be if you had a $5,000 contribution that was illegal, you might get a $50 fine. Now that, and that's the cost of doing business, no big deal. Now a $5,000 illegal contribution can run you a $10,000 fine. That's not good business, but it's good reform. That in, so it gives real teeth to the city clerk to enforce these. Aurora came next in 2020, last year. Um, they hit some of the same things, but very big, big reforms there. They put in limits on con campaign contributions like Colorado Springs. They do not have, did, did not have contribution limits. Now they do. They prohibited corporations from contributing. Uh, they put restrictions on uh, coordination between campaigns and dark money groups. Um, the use of campaign funds, they created small dollar funds, uh, small dollar committee, small donor committees to um, empower those who are giving $50 a year and enable a group that is collecting $50 per individual per year to contribute to a campaign. And these kind of limits, these are overwhelmingly popular across the country and across party lines. 
is campaign finance, uh, campaign contribution limits. 71% of Republicans want it, 83% of Democrats want it, 76% of independents want it. Um, it's only elected officials who are out of the, out of the norm on this. Uh, they also added transparency and disclosure, more campaign finance reports, more details, more accuracy, stronger, more comprehensive reporting requirements for dark money groups, um, new disclaimer requirements to bring the political advertising into the light, and uh, additional disclosure reports on a regular basis for community information. And again, they got stronger insight, just uh, oversight, just as uh, Lakewood had uh, real teeth in the enforcement process. And the way this played out in the most recent um, Aurora races, again, you see a candidate A and B with a two to one advantage nearly for candidate B. When you put in just the campaign finance limits and take out corporate uh, donations, you get um, a reversal. You know, not a not a total reversal, but you know, uh, the advantage shifts to the candidate who's focusing on small dollar donors, on the constituents, on the community. Um, had Aurora um, used the um, the campaign finance model, uh, the the public financing model, you'd have uh, a total reversal of them, nearly that two to one advantage going to the first candidate who did that grassroots organization. Fort Collins is currently considering reforms that would give um, a dollar for dollar public match uh, for up to 50% of their proposed expenditure limit. So candidates have to have an opponent on the ballot. They have to raise 10% of the expenditure from contributions of no more than $25 each to qualify. They can only accept those contributions, qualifying contributions from natural persons and those people have to be from Fort Collins, from the city of Fort Collins. Um, once they've reached eligibility, then they get uh, an expenditure limit. It's $25,000 for mayoral candidates, which is in keeping with what has been spent traditionally there, went a little higher in this last election, and $15,000 for council candidates. Again, only from natural persons. They can contribute up to 10% of their own money to their campaign, um, and they have to return any unexpended campaign funds to the city and agree to participate in one public forum. A lot of these options um, can only happen as options. If you're opting into this, it's not a requirement, but if you choose to opt in, then you would be limiting your own contributions to your own campaign, for example. Um, the cost would be $80,000 for the most recent, uh, for the past election. Um, the 2021 election that they had on the same day as your election, it would have been $82,500. So um, Denver's, that's per year. Um, Denver's is 2 million per, per year. And that's one tenth of 1% of Denver's annual budget. So a very small place pay, price to pay for clean and fair elections. Um, this is a snapshot of our website and a look at Colorado Springs uh, reporting. We have reports on all the communities we're involved in up there. Um, and we show where the money's coming from, how it breaks down in state, uh, individual contributions, special interest contributions. As you scroll down, you start to see the groups that are contributing to a given candidate and um, you know, see who's trying to influence the vote in Colorado Springs. I encourage you to go to cleanslatenowaction.org to dive deeper into this. Um, in Colorado Springs, in the most recent election, this is one of the races. You can see um, candidate B had a slight edge, pretty close. Candidate D was way out of it, but you know their funding was entirely from corporations, save $38 that came from the candidate himself. Um, when you uh, take away the corporate donations and put in the limits, you get these new numbers. Again, you're taking half the money out of the equation right now, and your candidate C is coming out um, slightly ahead uh, in this case, instead of you know, a little bit of a reversal here. So it shakes things up, but it also definitely um, puts things on equal foot to a large extent. I wanna finish up with a quick look at three long-term uh, cities and states that have uh, been doing this for a long time and have great models to look at. On the matching funds front, New York has been doing this for decades. And this is a map of New York City showing the density of donors to campaigns the top map shows donors to state campaigns. The bottom map shows candidates, uh, donors to city campaigns. And the difference between state and city is the st city has public financing. So when you add public financing, you get all those darker shades 
uh, on the map in, in this example um, citywide because um, we would think that's a partly a result of knowing that their $10 now becomes $100. Their voice is amplified. They're able to be heard the same way big money is able to be heard. So when, they're, when they feel like their contribution matters, uh, they do get engaged, they do contribute. And you see that incredible shift in density with the same population, uh, just the difference being whether there's matching funds at the state level, which there were not at the time of this map, or the city level, which there were. And this is just zooming in on a certain neighborhood, the bed neighborhood. And again, incredible shift in the engagement um, at the donor level of just small dollar donations, any amount, but um, uh, public financing brings that out to people. Seattle has what may be the gold standard. Um, they do a voucher system, which uh, they call democracy dollars, and they give four $25 vouchers to every registered voter. They can give those um, to candidates and it's real campaign money. Uh, they can give it all to one candidate. They can give it to four different candidates, any combination, as long as those candidates have opted in for the public financing and meet the criteria. It gives voice to citizens a modest means. Um, it's been incredibly popular, record-breaking fundraising, uh, a, a great way of putting um, disposable cash that can only be used for campaigns into the hands of every voter, many of whom wouldn't have that option otherwise. Uh, and, and so it's empowering populations that have been left in the shadows. Groups like you know people on fixed incomes, people working minimum wage jobs, people without homes. These people have been ignored in the past, but now candidates have to pay attention to them, have to go and listen to them, and hopefully come away with their support and their donations. And finally, um, clean elections. This is where you qualify and then you get a, basically a grant that covers your whole campaign expenses and you're done. You're done raising money once you qualify and you focus on getting your ideas out there. Connecticut is the best example for this. And I often talk about Connecticut, remembering Newtown and the elementary school um, shooting there. And we ask, you know, what has happened since then on gun safety? And the answer is always nothing. But in, that's true at the federal level, but at the state level, Connecticut, which has a citizen-owned election where it's public financed and the legislature is not um, bought by special interest groups and big money, uh, they voted for the um, most comprehensive gun safety regulations in the country as a result of that uh, school shooting. Um, they also passed things like paid sick days, raising the minimum wage, and state tuition for undocumented students. This is the kind of thing you get when you get citizen-owned elections again. And when you're incentivizing candidates by telling them, you know, that if they if they can go uh, ignore the deep pockets, the PACs, the insiders, and go to your district, spend time in your community, talk and listen to your constituents, you can come away with even greater resources by going to the people to power the campaign. How can they not choose to go into the district and take that option if, if you give it to them? The result is incredible. You know, you get voter turnout increasing, uh, people feel like they matter and they're playing a role in determining the outcomes. Communities of colors get, color get more engaged. Lower income communities can finally come out of the bleachers and onto the playing field. Wealth and access to wealth are taken out of the equation. Um, and you get uh, these more diverse candidates running and getting elected, including more women, more young people, and more people of color. So you can get involved. You can go to the Clean Slate Now Action.org website to keep up with what we're doing. We're planning a forum in Colorado Springs to take a deeper dive. So sign up as a volunteer in these early stages of planning in the Springs and you know, um, attend a planning session that we're going to have hopefully in the next month. We'll announce that shortly. Um, you know, Build a movement. Invite a spokesperson to come and educate your group. Uh, talk about this. Uh, listen to the, uh, your concerns. Uh, as people become more aware of what's going on, they become more engaged. It matters. They want to know um, they vote based on that knowledge. Make your voice heard. Talk to your city council members, um, community meetings, city council meetings. Urge them to support meaningful campaign finance reform. And if um, you can also do this on the federal level with For the People Act right now, call your senators, urge them to fix the filibuster and pass the For the People Act. Write letters to the editor. And you know, if your council won't listen to you and won't act, take your initiative. Uh, take a launch a citizens initiative, put it on the ballot. There's overwhelming public support. If council won't act, the people will. So here's the contact information again. I uh, want to thank you and let you get back to the rest of the program. Um, thank you again so much for coming out on 
on the night of the Midsummer Classic. I'll get back to it. And uh, thank you all for um, your participation here. Uh, stop sharing and say goodbye. Take care. Thanks. I hope to see you at an upcoming meeting in Colorado Springs. Take care.